Amen. Okay, Romans chapter 7. Yes, we read this last week, but I'm going to read it again. Again, I'm going to read from verse 13, and I'm going to stop in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Okay? Therefore, did that which is good, he's talking about the law here. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing that I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me just get my timer here. We are talking um, in the book of Rome, from the book of Romans, we've been talking about God's gift of righteousness. Now, on the one hand, some of these terms are, they're all sort of biblical terms and people lose sight of what the, he's trying to get across. And sometimes these things come across in such a way where you think that the issue is learning all the right terms. And we miss the fact that what God has always been after is that you yourself would be good, you would be well, you'd be whole. You remember John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? So that whoever believes in him would have a proper religious education and know the right terms that the Bible speaks about. Right? What a high price to pay if that's all you get. He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus was willing to die horribly on a cross because it was the only way that God had that you could have life and have it abundantly. God so loved the world, John chapter 3.16 says, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. In that one verse, we have captured for us the entire message of the Bible. People are perishing. And there's nothing they can do by themselves. So God gave His Son. So that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have eternal life. Okay? So, what does God want for you? Eternal life. What does that mean? It doesn't just mean live forever. You are always going to live forever. By design, you are going to live forever. The question is where? And what God wants is the quality of life that represents heaven 
to be in your life now, saving you down here. I am sure you are aware that this place that we live in is full of trouble. It is full of trouble. It is full of trouble that we cause ourselves. It is full of trouble that other people cause. It is full of trouble that happens because of both parts of that trouble mingling together. And God knows what it's like down here. So whatever he means by eternal life, it is something that deals with trouble here. So this idea, gift of righteousness, what we're getting at is God's provision to help you in the midst of this broken place. Okay? All of the trouble in the world is because people do not do what is right. They don't behave like God. God always does what is right. He is always kind. He is always gracious. He is always merciful. When you see judgment come, it would not be God's first reaction. It would be his reaction after a series of Offering to help you, to help you, to help you, to help you, and then finally. There is coming a day when judgment will come, but it is not today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where you could take God's hand, and he could lift you up out of the miry clay. And when judgment finally comes, people will never be able to say, I didn't know. I didn't know that's what you were like. I didn't know you wanted good for me. If I knew that, they will never be able to say that, okay? So the takeaway today is God wants to help you today, now. And this message concerning God's righteousness has to do with how God can help you today, now, okay? It really is the case that God's way of living is so much more wholesome, healthy, peaceful, full than your life with God's stuff added to it. Okay, did you catch what I'm trying to say? There really is the situation. This really is the case. If you think that you can get through this place with doing your own thing and adding a few God flavors to it, okay, I'll come to church. I'm glad you're here, by the way. Okay, so don't take this as, oh, I don't got to come to church. Ah, finally, I'm off the hook. No, but do you understand that merely coming to church doesn't actually help you as much as God wants to? Do you understand that turning the praise music on once in a while, let's take once in a while out of it, turning the praise music on all the time doesn't necessarily help you as much as you might think it does if nothing else in your life changes. Like if the only part of praise is the volume on the radio and there is no praise coming from you, you're actually not being so helped. Right? This is what I mean by you live your own life and add some God flavoring to it. That will not help you. That will not save you. God said, this is a serious thing. My son has to die. The only way that you can be saved is if somehow you are destroyed first. How can that possibly be? I'll destroy Jesus in your place. And if you are willing to believe him, if you are willing to ask him to save you, I will put you inside Jesus. I don't have my hat. Oh, there's my hat. You know what I'm Okay, this is going to be a stretch, but I hope you can carry it. This is Jesus. Jesus died on a cross, and he was buried. And three days later, he rose again, he spent 40 days with his disciples, and now he, he has ascended to the right hand of God. But it's not just that Jesus died, okay? And thereby he paid a penalty that each one of us should pay. What actually happened when you are born, when you put your trust into Jesus, you said, Lord Jesus, save me. I know you came and you died for the sins of the world, but save me. My sins are going to destroy me. All that I have done is going to destroy me, and I have no right to heaven. Save me. What happened? Well, I said, Jesus died. This is you. You were hidden inside Jesus. And so when Jesus died, you died. 
And when Jesus was raised up, you were raised up into the newness of life. And when he was raised up into heaven, you were given a promise, you're going to be with me. You're going to be with me. You are no longer what you used to be. This is the, a very quick summary of what we've been talking about from Romans chapter 6 onwards. That this is the unfolding of the brilliant scheme God has to save you. Let's face it, at your very best, you're going to fall short. At your very, very best, you're going to fall short. And Romans 6, 7, 6 and 7 lay that out. At your very best, you're going to fall short. So hallelujah, God is not counting on your very best. And this is the thing that we need to get a, a grip on. Is God, now that you have heard this message about Jesus dying for you, and hopefully you've responded to that message uh, personally, because if you haven't, like I said, being in church doesn't help you, okay? Uh, that's not to say don't come. I'm glad that you're here. But it isn't the being here that makes the difference. It is putting your trust in Jesus that makes the difference. If you personally have never at some point in time said to Jesus, I need you to save me, you need to do that. If you need someone to help you, get me afterwards or anybody else in the church afterwards and say, please help me with this. Okay? Because it needs you to say something. It needs you to say something. This is a bit of a weird analogy. But I can't, I can't say, like, I can't write my daughter's driving test for her. Why? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with me writing my daughter's driving test? Driving test is supposed to be an indication of whether you are qualified to drive a car, not whether your dad is qualified to drive a car. I'm sure there are people who cook up all sorts of weird schemes to do that, but that is more just an illustration of the lack of righteousness than it is a good example. So somebody else can't say yes to Jesus for you. They, you have to say yes to Jesus yourself. Right? Without that, we cannot enter into what God wants to give you to help you with everyday life. Okay? I really mean it. If God doesn't make a difference in your everyday life, something is wrong. Your understanding of what He wants, your obedience of what He wants, something is wrong. Because God did not spend... He did not crush his son so that you could just try harder. And hopefully it works out. Okay? This is the message that's in Romans. But you know what? Also buried in Romans 5, 6, and 7. Sorry, I didn't drop in 5. Is that the moment you believe in Jesus, something miraculous happens. As I said, you die, you're raised up, and God no longer has problem with you. I think I could make a convincing case that God actually has no problem with that unsaved neighbor that you know. It isn't to say that he accepts their sinful life and that um, he will somehow sidestep their need to come to Jesus. But Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. God's perspective on every person is, I want to help you. Will you let me? Will you let me? But certainly, for those who have put their trust in Jesus, you have the right to say this. I have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Your every day should be carried with this thought, God has no problem with God has no problem with me. I mean, he might not approve of what I just did or the way I used my mouth, but he has no problem with me. How can you possibly say that, Titus? Well, it's not because Titus got his act together. It's because Titus was hidden in Jesus. And when Jesus died, Titus died. And when Jesus was raised up, Titus was raised up into the newness of life. And every reason why God should punish Titus ended. So he doesn't think in terms of punishing you. If you are born again, if you put your trust in Jesus, 
every day of your life should be carried with this thought. God has no problem with me. Can you say that? If you can, come and see me. Because otherwise, why are we talking about all this stuff? It isn't so that your ears are filled with my voice. It doesn't help you as much as you might imagine. It doesn't help you as much as I might imagine. God really wants to help us. Every day of your life is to be governed by this thought. God has no problem with me. God is at peace with me. There are things that may need to be corrected. Fine. There are things that I need to change. Fine. But God has no problem with me. I am beloved. I am accepted in the beloved. He goes on further, and he says that he has so thoroughly broken the power of sin that you are no longer a slave of sin if you believed into Jesus. If you believe into Jesus, I mean, your experience might be that sin still seems to have a grip on you and that you keep doing stuff that you, don't, you know is wrong. But the reality is, if you have believed into Jesus, then all your sins have been forgiven you. Even in the Psalms it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed his transgressions from me. And that's referring to a flat earth. And for the record, if it needs to be said, the earth is not flat. But a map, a projection of the earth is flat. And you know that east and west never meet. So how far have your sins been removed from you? How close are they to you from his perspective? Now, you might keep a recollection of them. You might keep them near and think that that's what defines you. But from God's perspective, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your sins, your transgressions from you. But it's not just the transgressions. Sin itself shall not be master over you. There's a difference between sin and sins. Okay? And let me try and explain quickly. Sins are the wrong deeds that you do. Sin is why you do it. So God has covered all the wrong things we've done, but he's also broken the back of the reason why you would do it in the first place. And he wants you to come into that freedom. Sin is a tyrant. It is an evil, wicked tyrant who wants to ruin your life. And God comes along and in Jesus breaks its power and sets you free. And he wants you now to walk with him so that you experience the freedom of being set free from sin. Okay? And this is why I'm saying to you again, you cannot afford to tolerate a way of thinking that says, I just need a little bit of God in my life. I'll just add a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm sorry, I'm not into that praise stuff at all. Sorry, I, I, I'm, not into, I'm not into criticizing other people at all. I'm not going to call sin, sin. I'm sorry, I'm, I just, the, the, my mouth is the way I talk. I've talked this way for all my years of life. It's just the way it is. You cannot afford to tolerate a God-flavored life merely because it will not allow you to experience the freedom that you are actually entitled to. So for us who have believed into Jesus, the issue is not God holding back on us. I'm not willing to give you some good things. It is the way we think and the way we live keeps us outside of what God wants for us. So another place that you have to come to in your adventure with God is the place where you say, I want you and all of you, and I'm willing to let anything that I need to let go, go. This is not Titus's idea merely. You'll find this pattern in the scriptures over and over and over again where people have to leave something to get something better. But they don't see what it is that they're going to get, so there's a risk in leaving what they have. There's a risk in leaving what they have, and the only thing that can comfort them in the risk of leaving that is, but God is right. God is good. God is merciful. God is faithful. I put my trust in Him. God's plan of salvation has got you figured out. You, are not, you don't have too difficult a life for Him. You really don't. I don't care whether your parents were angels or your parents was, were the devil themselves. I don't care why you think your life is messed up or it isn't messed up. 
I don't care what you think is your advantages or what your disadvantages are. Jesus is more than enough. He really is. But you've got to walk his way. Okay? I mean, we, we need to be very deliberate in our words to others of being gracious, to open a door for them to come in. But please, don't misunderstand me. When I say things like, God has no problem with you, or, you know, we sang, um, he's a good, good father. And I hear in the, in, in, the, in the midst of the darkness, I hear that he's pleased. Don't mistake that for saying, and so it doesn't matter how you live your life. It matters how you live your life. Let me put it this way. Do you want to experience salvation or just be qualified for it? Do you actually want to have it? Do you want to see God helping you with the everyday stuff? Or do you just want to know, I could have that. Hallelujah, I'm no longer dead in my sins. I could have that, but I'm going my way. I pray that the Spirit of God stirs us and says, no, no, I, w- I actually want help. I actually want help. Okay? So we've been working through Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7. He's been explaining to us how thorough God's plan of salvation is in Jesus. Like I said, you died. It wasn't merely, I'll fix you up. Try harder. Be better next time. I cancel out all your sins. Now you try better. You're back at square one. Don't mess up. This is not Christianity. This is not the salvation of God. You die. And now what has to change is you've got to change what you think about yourself. Where you think about yourself something that God does not, you're vulnerable. Where you don't think something about yourself that God does think about you, you're vulnerable. He says you're forgiven. If you don't agree, you're vulnerable. He says you are beloved. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Even what comes against you, I'll turn to your advantage. But if you don't agree, it doesn't stop what God's saying from being true, but you miss out. You are vulnerable to accusation. Trouble comes up. Have you ever been like like this? Today's a good day. Why is it a good day? The sun is shining. My car is working. I'm not feeling sick. Nobody's called me names. Today is a good day. Tomorrow, my car is not working. It's smoky as anything out there. My boss just called and found out that I made a mistake at work, and now I'm going to be docked pay. My family just called and reminded me why I don't like to be part of that family. Today is not a good day. Today is not a good day. Today is not a good day. I'm hoping the day after that will be a good day. And what do I mean by that? That the sun will be shining again. That nobody will call me names. So I go up and down and up and down and up and down. That is an exhausting way to live. Speaking from personal experience. It is an exhausting way to live, and I was never meant for it. What's the problem? God has said certain things about me that I will not stand on. I'm waiting for him to confirm it with my experience. Because if God is for me, then the sun will be shining, and nobody calls me names. And I've got it backwards. Despite the sun not shining, and despite people calling me names, God is for me. I am not governed by my circumstances. I'm governed by what God has made known. These are the steps that we take in progressing in salvation. I don't have so much time, so I'm going to end very quickly here. In Romans chapter 7, he's been explaining this whole, a number of details that comes out of what happened when you died. And he's trying to show you. So God has so thoroughly solved the problem of sin. One of the problems of sin is condemnation. There's another fancy biblical word. What does that mean? You carry within you a sentence of, I'm guilty. I know I'm guilty. I know I'm wrong. I know I don't measure up. I don't measure up. I don't measure up. I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. I never measure up. I never measure up. And how (coughs) he helps us here is he says, you know, part of the issue is, okay, so you start thinking, I need to do what God wants me to do. 
But instead of putting your trust in what God has provided for, you try to find the ability to do what God wants you to do inside you. Inside you. Okay? It's not for today. One of the characteristics of, of, of the old person before you were born again is it wants to boast. Meaning, it wants to say, no, I'm not as bad as God says I am. And I can prove it. I can prove it. Look at how much money I gave to the charities. Okay? And look, normally I slap my brother. But yesterday I didn't. Yesterday I did not. In fact, I haven't done it for two days in a row. There is this thing within fallen mankind that wants to defy God and say, I'm not as bad as you say I am. I'm not as bad as you say I am. And God is saying, you are far worse than you realize. You are far worse than you realize. But there is this way, even after we're born again, to find the grace to obey God in ourselves. This is what he means by flesh. Okay? I started talking to you about this last week. I've talked with you before about it. When God uses the word flesh, what does he mean? Okay? He doesn't just mean meat. Okay? Strangely enough, the word in Greek is actually the same. But he does not mean this physical muscle, these fingers, these bones. He doesn't merely mean that. What he means is what you are apart from God. If God does not come to dwell in you, what are you? Flesh. Okay? Well, people. Even after they're born again, they retain their re recollection and their way of thinking from when they were apart from God. And they try to bring that into now trying to serve God. And it fails. It always fails. It always fails. And they carry a sense of, I just don't do what's right. I'm always wrong. So what is the surprise that my life is the way it is? God is just always mad at me. Hmm. If you were paying attention, you would have realized we dealt with that back in Romans chapter 5. God is not mad at you. God is not mad at you. God is not mad at you. How does that make any sense? If he gave his son for you, how can it make sense that you think, yeah, and God's mad at me? What do you got to do about that? Stop believing the lie and stand against it. Lies are they feel good. They are persuasive. If they make sense, because if my life is such a mess, obviously God is mad at me. No. Not true. Not true. So you have to stand against it and say, but God said this. God said this. Okay. So, Christians, if they don't have the way they think renewed, if the way they think about themselves, about what God wants, about how to do what God wants, doesn't start to come out of what God has said about them. They find within themselves, they try to, within themselves to do what is right before God. This is what God talks about flesh, the mind set on the flesh, on who you are apart from me. It will always fail. But you also carry with you a sense of, I just don't measure up. I just don't measure up. I just don't measure up. Unfortunately, because of the time I have, I don't have time to build too much more on this. I'm convinced that the, the people who have not yet put their trust in Jesus and people who have put their trust in Jesus but don't realize certain things all carry a sense of condemnation, a sense of, I don't measure up. I don't do what is right. People deal with that in different ways. Some people become hard to it. It doesn't matter what I do. I can do whatever I want. And it's their way of protecting their selves from, because they know what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. But they become hardened to it. They become indifferent to it as a way of protecting themselves. Okay? People walk continually depressed. I just never do what is right. I never do what is right. I never do what is right. I never do what is right. How are you doing? That's a good day, but I never do what is right. I mean, you understand that they may say one thing with their mouths, the Proverbs have an interesting way of putting it. They say, even in the midst of joy, the heart can be sorrowful. Right? Even in the midst of a party, a person can be brokenhearted. 
So they can say, oh, good morning, isn't it a great day and all that, but in their heart they're carrying a sense of, I just never measure up. Do you think that has an effect on people? I would like to say it has a horrible effect on people. They were not meant to live this way. That thing within you that was supposed to be a guide to don't do this, but do this. A gift from God that is supposed to help you steer your life is just overwhelmed by, I never do what is right, I never do what is right, I never do what is right, I never do what is right. Now, just for the time being, leaving aside the effect it has on those who have not put their trust in Jesus, let's talk about the effect it has on those who do put their trust in Jesus. Okay? Now, you understand, before I finish here, I am not saying to you, just automatically assume everything you do is A-OK -okay with God, period. Okay? Your conscience is something that God has given you. It's, think of it this way. It's like a radio receiver so that you can receive uh, direction from God. Don't go this way. Go this way. Do you remember one of the promises that God makes his people is you'll hear a voice saying, turn to the left, turn to the right. Don't go this way. It is a promise from God that he will direct your steps, that he will guide you. Well, one of the ways he does that is with your conscience. The thing that is conscious of, am I doing right or am I doing wrong? Okay? So conscience is not the thing that needs to be gotten rid of. It just needs to be, it, it just needs to work properly. Okay? And when your confidence to do what God wants is rooted in yourself, your sincerity. I'm going to try hard. Today was not such a good day. I lost my temper. Okay, I blew it today. But tomorrow is a new day. Hallelujah. His mercies are new every morning. Tomorrow, I'm going to try much harder. And the problem with trying much harder is sometimes it works. I'm going to try much harder tomorrow. I'm going to try much harder tomorrow. Well, what's the problem here? You're, you're, you're still drawing from your own sincerity, your own, I can do this, instead of drawing from God has made it possible. God has already done it. He's not counting how many things I do right. He's not counting how many things I do right. Let me finish. Okay, so, for we know the, the law, let me read this again, 14 Romans chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing that... Sorry. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And oftentimes when people consider the way of their life, you know, I want to do this, but I never seem to do it. I don't do what I should do, and I do what I shouldn't do. And so they read this part in Romans, and says, yeah, exactly this. I find then the principle that evil is present within me. In my own self, apart from God, I am incapable of doing God. But for some reason, they stop at verse 25. What does the next verse say? Who will set me free from the body of his death? The implication is there's nobody who can. The next verse says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Doesn't that imply that God actually gave an answer then? Who can set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Okay, so that's the situation. I might want to do good, but the weakness within me makes it impossible. And I am therefore lined up to walk around always thinking, I don't measure up, I don't measure up, I don't measure up. 
And so we need to read the next verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. The law of sin and of death, the law, said you need to measure up or you will die. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus says, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. It takes the responsibility of measuring up from you and puts it on Jesus. And you get to benefit. You get to take, you get, to, how do you put it? It is credited to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? It takes you are used to thinking, i got to measure up. And God is saying, Jesus measured up for you, now walk with me. i got to show God that he ought to save me. i got to show him that I'm worthy of his help. God says, it's too late for all that. The moment you put your trust in Jesus, I give you everything. Now I want you to walk with me. I want you to walk with me. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death, if you break the law, you must die. But you're no longer under that law. Why do you still govern yourself as if God is seeing if you measure up? Why do you still govern your life and judge your life and judge your expectations based on do I measure up? Am I worthy of it? In this short time, I don't have, I don't mean to dismiss the need of being worthy. Okay? I, I'm not trying to say, it doesn't matter, live your life, whatever. You know I'm not trying to say that. But I am coming against this idea that it is normal and okay to live as if God is not for me. It is not. If you think, if you start tomorrow morning, with the thought, I'm not sure that God will help me today, then you have not understood the gospel concerning Jesus Christ. You may have understood a part of it, but you're missing a big part of it because you still think God hasn't made up his mind about you. The moment you believe in Jesus, God is for you. How can that possibly be? Well, he's not cooking the books. He's not, he's not just playing favorites. He actually paid. He actually paid for your sins. And now he's expecting you to act like your sins have been paid for. Do you see what I'm saying? He's expecting you to act like you've been forgiven. And if you don't think you've been forgiven, if this makes no sense to you, I want to ask you why. Why does it make no sense? And what you will find is you are determined to keep your confidence in what you yourself have to do, in your own strength, your own sincerity. You have to abandon yourself into the hands of Jesus as you pay for my sins. I'm taking you at your word. Because though your sins have been forgiven you, the devil has not yet been removed from the world, and he accuses you. And his accusations sound right. They make sense. You did do that wrong. You should not have done that. I can't imagine why you did that, but you did it. How could God possibly? And you are called to simply take a stand on, I'm going to act like Jesus forgave me of all my sins. I'm going to talk to God as if all my sins have been forgiven me. I'm going to talk to my damaged hip as if God has forgiven me of all my sins. I'm going to pray that the weather changes as if God has no problem with me. But how can you say that your life is not, your life is like a mess? How can you possibly act that way? Now you see what you're being called into. To completely and confidently take your stand in who Jesus is and what he has done. And not what you can do in view of it. Okay? He does not, to be careful here. He does not reward you according to your performance. 
He rewards you, if I can use that word this way. He responds to you in view of your trusting Jesus. And that's where we want to be. That's where we want to be. Okay, we're going to stop there. I ask, Father, that you would open the eyes of our hearts. That you would take things that are so precious and so magnificent and, all, and, and too big for our brains to grasp and help our spirits to respond to you, Father, to take you at your word, that we might walk in the freedom that Jesus purchased for us. And I thank you that your grace is available for every person who hears this teaching, starting with me, to be able to say yes to you and take another step in you. I thank you that you have forgiven us of all our sins, that as far as the east is from the west, so far are our transgressions from us. That we are no longer slaves to sin, we who have believed in Jesus. We are no longer slaves to sin, for sin shall not be master over us. For we are not under law, we are under your grace. And it is in your grace that we are able to respond to you. And I ask you to bring us into this freedom in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen.